First Samuel chapter 12. First Samuel chapter 12. That'll be where we'll start this evening. Before we get started in First Samuel chapter 12 real quick, though we want to run through, as we have the last few weeks, our outline of the book of First Samuel. We divided it up by the characters we're following. We said 1 to 8 we're following Samuel. We finished that section last week. 9 through 15 is Saul. We'll finish that section tonight. And then starting next week and on through the end of the book, 16 to 31, the main character we're going to follow is going to be David. The book of 1 Chronicles, we're also studying that at the same time. Though we'll pass through that rather quickly this evening, as again in these early chapters we're going through genealogies and a list of names. But in 1 Chronicles, we divided it into two major sections. The first nine chapters are genealogies, and then 10 through 29 is the reign of David. Before we get into 1 Samuel 12, real quickly, 1 Chronicles 5 this is the family of Reuben, verses 1 through 10. Beginning at verse 11 and going through verse 22 is the family of Gad, and then they'll cover the family of Manasseh on the east side of the Jordan in 23 through the end of the text. If you remember, Manasseh had half on the east side and half on the west side, and the half on the east, those genealogies are covered there in First Chronicles chapter 5. But let's talk about First Chron- or First Samuel chapter 12. 12, 13, 14, and 15 this evening. Let's start in chapter 12. Chapter 12 divides itself into four major sections. The first of those is Samuel's question and the people's response. So beginning at verse 1. Now Samuel said to Israel, Indeed, I have heeded your voice in all that you said to me and made a king over you. And now here is the king walking before you. And I am old and gray-headed, and look, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. Here I am. Witness against me before the Lord and before His anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I received any bribe with which to blind my eyes? I will restore it to you. And they said, you have not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. Then he said, the Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that you have not found anything in my hand. And they answered, he is witness. So beginning at verse 1, Samuel has now made the point, remember we went through last week in chapter 8, they cry out and demand what? They demanded a king, and so they've cried out and demanded a king, and so now he's making the point, you've asked for a king, and now you have received a king. And so here you have the king, here's the king you have asked for, I've given you the king, now I ask you this question, have I ever cheated any of you? Have I ever taken anything from any of you? Let me know if I have. If I have, I will restore it to you. Let the Lord be witness and let his anointed, that is Saul the king, be witness as well. And the people say, you've never taken anything from us, you've never cheated us, you've never taken or oppressed us. And so he said, the Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day. You found nothing in my hand, and they say, so, they say he is witness. So he, they've testified now, nothing has been found. And all the days of Samuel is judged that he is not oppressed, nor has he cheated anyone. And remember, he is an old man now. He said he's an old and gray-headed. And here's a man that, is, that has been with them and leading them from his childhood. So in all those years, they could find nothing that he had done against them. Really, let's start focusing in on verse 6 through verse 18. And 6 through 18 in the second major section is Samuel's warning to the people. Pick up at verse 6. Here's Samuel's warning to the people. Then Samuel said, It is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still, that I may reason you with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord which He did to you and your fathers. Let's stop right there for just a moment. Samuel's telling them, he starts back and goes back to Moses and Aaron and how, how God had led them out of Egypt by the hand of Moses and Aaron. But he tells them, be still, stand still, because he's going to reason with them and make the point to them 
from all the things the Lord had done concerning the righteous acts of the Lord that he did for them and for their fathers. So we're fixing to get into the righteous acts. Let's talk about what those righteous acts are. When Jacob, going back to Jacob now, had gone into Egypt, and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt, and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot their God... He sold them into the hands of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, into the land of the Philistines, and into the land of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. What is he referencing here? In verse 9. What time period? He's talking about the time period of the judges. So now we've gone, we go back to Moses and Aaron and how God has has led them out of the land of Egypt when they cried out. And now you come a little bit later, after they've cried out and they've been delivered from the hands of Moses and Aaron, they come into the land and they forgot God, he said in verse 9. And so he sold them into the hand and he gives this list. Here are the people that he sold them into the hand to fight against. Now listen to what the people's response is in verse 10. This is the people of the day of the judges, in the days of the judges. Then they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Asherahs, but now deliver us from the hand of our enemies and we will serve you. So now the people back at that time frame in the days of the judges cried out to God when they were faced, when they realized they had done wrong and cried, We have sinned, we have forsaken the, the, you by serving the Baals and the Asherahs to so deliver us. That, by the way, is from the days of Jephthah. He's going to list a long line here of people, but that's specifically in the days of Jephthah where they cry out and God, they cry out that they've sinned, but they made no real change and God told them He would not deliver them and then finally they made a real change later on. But He goes back. They've cried out. Here's what happened. The Lord sent Zerubbabel, Baden, Jephthah, and Samuel and delivers you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you dwelt in safety. Among this list of people here, Samuel lists himself. He's one of the judges and one of the ones that's helped deliver Israel. But listen to what he says in verse 12. And when you saw Nahash, king of the Ammonites, come against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign, shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. We're going back and talking about dealing with what he talked about in chapter 8. Or he's made the point, you've asked for a king, here's the warnings, you still want a king, you can have a king. But now he's coming here in chapter 12, and he's warning the people again. Now, Saul is taking over as king. We saw last week what happened to Jabesh Gilead and Saul's leadership. And here he's coming in chapter 12, and he said, this is what you did. You cried out and asked for a king, but you needed to realize, and you forgot the fact that the Lord was your king. Just like the people had previously done in the days of the judges. The people in the days of the judges, remember, one of the key verses in the book of Judges, which we just finished studying, is everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Why? Because there was no king. So everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They were not coming to the realization that God was their king. And so they did whatever they wanted to do instead of being governed by the law of God. But well, other people today, they want a king to rule over them just like everybody else has. They want this, this ruler, this governing authority over them. But when they're doing so, they're, they're rejecting what? They're rejecting God and God is king. We want a king like everybody else when the fact is they had a king all along. They just weren't realizing and serving him as they should. Now here's what he says in verse 13. Now therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. And take note, the Lord has set a king over you. Now notice 14 and 15. This is very important. If you fear the Lord and serve Him and obey His voice and do not rebel against the command of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However... If you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. What did we learn in 14 and 15? Even though you have a king, you can't do nothing. They have to follow what God 
Is it not to follow what God has said even though they have a king? What else do we see? Right. Right. What we're seeing is God has made a promise, and I think this is something Israel to this point has not realized. Remember, what is Israel from now all the way into the New Testament put a lot of stock in? They're of the seed of who? Of Abraham. And being of the seed of Abraham to them was enough. Well, we're of the seed of Abraham. We're of the seed of Abraham, you know. And it was just sort of one of those things. It was almost like a get out of jail free card. We're of the seed of Abraham, so we're okay. And, and, and here there's these promises that are given. People want to know, well, why is it that Israel is supposed to occupy the land, but Israel's not in the land of this day here in 2021? You know, some people, we talk about going back into the land, and they'll talk about going back into the land and all this premillennialism. But understand this. The promise was completely and totally fulfilled when it came to the occupying of the land and the creation of the nation. The nation promise was fulfilled in Exodus chapter 20, when the law was given, the land promise was fulfilled in the days of Joshua because he said not a word the Lord had spoken had failed to come to pass. So that promise was fulfilled, but the promise was conditional upon their obedience. And Samuel's reminding them of that. It's not just that, okay, we've occupied the land and everything's okay, but you've got to remember, you've still got to obey God. And if you do, He'll be with you. And if you do not, he will be against you. The promises that God gives can be, and often are, conditional. Just like the promise that was given here. The promise was conditional upon their obedience. Then they could stay in the land and the Lord would continue to be with them. But if they rejected God and they turned away from God, then he would no longer be with them. Verse 16. Now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before you. Is today not the wheat harvest? I will call to the Lord and He will send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord and asking a king for yourselves. So Samuel called to the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day and the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. So Samuel says, here's the day of the first harvest. I'm going to cry out to God and we'll just show you how great your sin is by asking for a king. The Lord will thunder and send rain today. And when this takes place, then you will realize how great your wickedness is. And it comes to pass, and verse 18 says, that great fear fell upon the people. They were fearful. Now they've come to the realization that what? They're sin. They're in sin. And remember, they, Samuel had just told them that the promises were conditional upon their obedience, and they now realize they are a disobedient people. So here's their response. Verse 19, our third major point in our outline. The people's response. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. You've already got these, these, these things they've already done aside from asking for a king. The people may still be serving the bells and the asteroids. They still do what they want to do. They've not obeyed the commands of God. And here now they've come to the realization, not only have we done these other things, but now we've sinned even more by asking for a king. Now verse 20 through 25 is Samuel's closing remarks. But 20 to 25 is also a great invitation. Look at what he says here. Do not fear... Remember the people of verse 18 were what? According to verse 18, what fell upon the people? Fear. fear. Do not fear, Samuel says in verse 20. You have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve Him with all your heart, and do not turn aside, for then you would go after empty things, which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. For the Lord will not forsake His people for His great name's sake, but it pleased the Lord to make you His people. So here, he's telling them, don't fear right now. Now, eventually, God will, when they forsake God, God will punish them. But God's not going to forsake you right now. But you need to turn back to serving God and no longer turn aside from following Him. 
Serve Him with all your heart, it says in verse 20. So turn to Him and serve Him and serve Him with a whole heart and do not turn aside to go after the empty things, the things which are of no profit, the things that are nothing. Now here's what he says for his own sake, verse 23. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things He has done for you. Here's something interesting in verse 23. We can sin by ceasing to pray for one another. The people asked Samuel for prayer on their behalf. Now, Samuel is their leader here, but I think it's an important point to understand. He said he would sin against the Lord if he had ceased to pray for them. We can cease to pray for one another today, and we can be sinning as well when we cease to pray for our brethren and for those who are in need. But look again, focusing on verse 24. Fear the Lord, serve Him in truth with all your heart, and consider what great things He has done for you. You've got to turn back to God, serve Him. And by the way, here's an interesting note in verse 24. What does He tell them to do in verse 24? Only what? Fear the Lord. But what does He tell them not to do in verse 20? Do not be afraid. That shows us the two components of fear. Now, there is fear in the sense that we are fearful of being punished for doing what is wrong. And that's what the reaction of the people here is. And that can motivate us. But eventually, and the longer we serve God, that fear, the fear that would be more of terror, is is less and less and replaced more with reverence and respect. And so the people here don't need to be fearful in the sense that they're, they're trembling and afraid, but serve God, and you need to replace that with what? Reverence and respect for God. If you reverence and respect God, then you'll serve Him with all your heart. You'll consider the things you have done. But instead, verse 25, if you do wickedly, you will be swept away, both you and your king. And that's Samuel's address to the people here in 1 Samuel Chapter 12. Let's move on into chapter 13. Saul's unlawful sacrifice. 1 to 15 is Saul's unlawful sacrifice. We'll get to 16 through 23 in a moment. Israel had, had no weapons at the time. They were getting ready for war. Saul reigned one year. And when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and the mountains of Bethel. And 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. So Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel heard that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel had become an abomination to the Philistines, and the people were gathered together to Saul at Gilgal. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and the people, at, people as the sand, which is of the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Avon. When the men of Israel saw they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then they hid in the caves and thickets and rocks and holes and pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over to the Jordan of the land of, the, of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he saw he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. And then he waited seven days, according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattered for him, from him. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will come down to me. Uh, at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. So here, we'll stop there for just a moment. We'll pick up in 13 in a second. Here, they're getting ready for battle, and it's a great battle, and the people are fearful, and, and Saul wants to offer sacrifice to God, which is an admirable thing to do. And so Saul wants to offer the sacrifice to God before they go into battle. And Samuel says he'll be back in seven days, but he's not. And so Saul decides to offer the sacrifice to God himself instead of waiting for Samuel to come and offer the sacrifice, the one who had the right to offer the sacrifice. And so it said that 
so Saul does it, and, and we cannot deny that Saul was offering the sacrifice with some good intentions. We need a sacrifice to God, and it also helped the people to understand we've offered our worship to God before we go into battle. I don't doubt the sincerity of Saul in offering the sacrifice, but we need to understand this principle. Look at verse 13. You, this is what Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. From now the Lord would have, for now the Lord would have established your kingdom of Israel forever. We'll pick up in 14 in a second. But let's talk about verse 13 for a second. Saul may have had good intentions behind what he did. But that does not negate the commandment of the Lord. Good intentions, however good they may be, does not take the place of obedience to God. We'll see that again in 15. I think even more vividly in 15. But we'll see it here in 13 now. There may have been good intentions behind Saul, but it's said that Saul acted what? Or has done what? Foolishly. And he's not kept the commandment of God, which he had commanded him. It's also important in verse 14, that now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Saul, so your kingdom could have been established forever, verse 13, is what Samuel tells him. But instead, you have acted foolishly, and you have not obeyed the command of God, and now God is going to set up somebody over his kingdom who who is after his own heart, somebody that will keep his commandments because you have not kept the commandments of God. I think it shows us the severity of disobedience even when the intentions may be good. It, again, aside from the fact that it did not negate the fact that he did not obey, he was punished for what he did even though his intentions may have been good. He lost the kingdom and by the way, I think it's important to understand, Saul's not losing the kingdom because Saul made a mistake. Because if we take the mistake that Saul makes here in chapter 13, and when we get over into 2 Samuel here in a few weeks, and we see the sins of David, we would argue the sins of David are far greater than the sins of Saul. We could argue that at great least, that from the human standpoint, what David does later on is going to be far worse. But David's a man after God's own heart and Saul is rejected. Here's why. It had less to do with the sin committed and more to do with the attitude towards the sin. And more to do with the attitudes that led to the sin. David made some stupid mistakes. But Saul, what he's going to do here is a pattern of disobedience and a lack of respect for the, for the word of the Lord. It's the attitude behind the sin and the lack of, proper, of properly dealing with it, that is what leads to Saul's rejection. Not just that Saul made a mistake and God said, that's it, you're done. But it has to do with the attitude that Saul's having behind. Because his attitude to, I'll just offer the sacrifice so the people will feel better, though his intentions may have been good, was wrong and unlawful, and it showed a lack of reverence and respect for the word and the will of the Lord. So that's ultimately what's going to lead to, is what leading to Saul's rejection, not just that Saul makes a mistake here in 1 Samuel chapter 13. So Samuel rises, verse 15, he goes to Gilgal to Gibeah, from Gilgal to Gibeah, and Saul numbered the people present with him at about 600 men. Verse 16 through 23, they're getting ready for war and they find they have no weapons. Then Jonathan, Saul, Jonathan, his son, and the people present with him remained at Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. The raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies, and one company turned to the road towards Orphra, the land of Shual. Another company turned to the road of Beth Horon, and another company turned to the road at the border that overlooks the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. But all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, his mattock, his axe, and his sickle. And the charge for sharpening was the pim for the plowshares, the mattocks, the forks, and the axes, and to set the points of the goads. So it came about on the day of battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan, but they were found with Saul and Jonathan, his son. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to pass at Michmash. And we'll talk about verse 14 here in a moment. But they can't find any weapons among them because the way the Philistines 
I made sure there was no blacksmith in Israel. Let's talk about 14. Israel is going to defeat the Philistines. We'll run through 14 rather quickly because we want to get through 15 here in a moment and talk about some important lessons we learned in 15. Chapter 14. The first 19 verses is, is Jonathan and his armor bearer are going to go out and fight the Philistines. A couple of key statements we want to hit through rather quickly here in 14. Uh, this first 19 verses. So Jonathan and his armor bearer look out and they decide they're going to go out and fight against, fight against, um, the people of the people of the Philistines. They're going to go fight the Philistines. It's just Jonathan and his armor bearer. I want you to notice verse 6. This is a very important statement. Skip down to verse 6 with me. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. We're going to get to next week, and we'll talk some about next week, the friendship of Jonathan and David. And that's often what we think about when we think of Jonathan, is his friendship with David and, what he, and taking care of David. But let's talk about the faith of Jonathan here in chapter 14. In verse 6, he says that nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. It's the idea, the common idea of people, especially at that time, that it has to do with your strength. You know, the, the stronger you are as a nation, the better off you are. That's the general thought and the general idea. If we have more people and we have better weapons, then, then we're going to be victorious. But you know, when you go throughout, throughout history, there are times that you look at events that take place and battles that take place. We're not... For just a second, forget just the battles that take place in Scripture. Just think about through history itself that the person that shouldn't have won, won the battle. There was a book written several years ago about the Revolutionary War entitled Almost a Miracle. You think about the way that the people that fought for the, for the um, colonies were so outnumbered by the British Army and yet they won. You think about some other armies when you go throughout history where they were much smaller. Now, let's start talking about some Bible examples specifically. The Medes and the Persians versus the Babylonians that we'll get to later on in Scripture. The Babylonians were a fortified city. You know, they had the water run through the city to protect them. The Medes and the Persians overthrew them. How is it they are victorious? I think David sums it up, or Daniel sums it up well in Daniel chapter, or summed it well in Daniel chapter 4, and I believe it's first, it's in, it's in the 20s or 30s, where Daniel makes the point, and I think it's the key verse to the entire book, that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men. Ultimately, God's going to give the battle to whomever He chooses. He will help them. We'll see that next week in particular when we see David and Goliath. The battle belongs to the Lord. That's a song we sing sometimes. That statement, not in those specific words, is made by David. We'll see that next week. You know, that's, that's kind of Jonathan's point here in 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 6. The battle belongs to God, and whether it is by many or whether it is by few, then God can make us victorious. Gideon was victorious with this much smaller army. By the way, something that Samuel alluded to two chapters ago. When he mentions Zerubbabel, we better know him as Gideon. Jonathan understood the principle that if God's with you, then no one's going to stand against you. And God can save whether by many or whether by few. So as Armour Bear said, verse 7, Do all that is in your heart, go there, then, here I am with you, according to your heart. So Jonathan said, Very well, let us cross over to these men, and we will show ourselves to them. They say to us, Wait until we come to you then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. So you skip down to verse 12. The men of the garrison called to Jonathan his armor bearer and said, come up to us, and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, verse 12, come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. How many people are going up against the Philistines right now? Two. The entire army's not here yet. 
We're not going to see the entire army until down in about verse 20. But two men go up. So Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed them. That first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about half an acre of land. And there was trembling in the camp and the field and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled, and the earth quaked, so that it was a very great trembling. So the watchman of Saul at Gibeah uh, saw that. And so the people got ready, and they'll go into battle, dropping down to verse 20. Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled, and they went to battle, verse 20. And indeed, every man's sword was against his neighbor, and there was very great confusion. Moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding country, they also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim, when they heard the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in battle. So the Lord, the Lord, listen closely, so the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to Beth Haven. Let's talk about Saul's oath, verse 24. Verse 24, this is in the same section. They're going to join the battle, and here's Saul's oath. Cursed is the man, we're about halfway through verse 24, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening before I have taken vengeance on my enemies, so none of the people tasted food. So he says, Cursed be the one that takes the food. As time goes on, there is in verse 26 some honey that is dripping, but no one puts his hand to his mouth. Why? For they feared the oath, the oath that was made by Saul. And cursed is the man who eats any food. But who doesn't know about the oath? Jonathan. So in verse 27, Jonathan had not heard his father's charge with the people with the oath. Therefore he stretched out the end of his rod that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put it to his mouth and his countenance brightened. What's the reaction of the people here though? The reaction's like, wow, what? Look what they said. Your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats food this day, and the people were faint. That's sort of a rash oath, because he wants to pursue the people so hard to become victorious, he makes an oath, and nobody is to eat. Cursed be the one that eats before we get there. And his arm is beginning to become weak and faint. So Jonathan tells them, my father has troubled the land. Look now how my countenance is brightened because I taste a little of this honey. Jonathan doesn't understand. Why is it he'd make this oath? Look, my countenance was brightened when I had just a little of the honey. If these people had the honey, basically if Israel had the honey, if Israel had some food to eat, their countenance would be brightened. They would be, they would be better, better soldiers. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found, verse 30. For now there would, would there not have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? Look, he wants to press them hard. But listen, if the people were refreshed and ready to go, there would have been a greater slaughter of the Philistines and would have been taking care of them easier. But now they're going to drive them back that day from Michmash to Ahalon, in verse 31, and the people are very faint. So the people are going to rush the spoil, verse 32. They take the sheep, the ox, and the calves. They slaughter them on the ground, and the people ate with the blood. Verse 33, then they told the people saying, look, the people sin, this is what they told Saul, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. So he said, you have dealt treacherously, roll a large stone to me this day. Somebody comes and warns Saul, and Saul knows what the law is about eating with the blood. You can't eat anything with the blood. Why? Because the life is in the blood. And here the people are eating with the blood. So he says, you've dealt treacherously. So he says, verse 34, Disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, Bring me here every man's ox and every man's sheep. Slaughter them here and eat. And do not sin against the Lord by eating with the blood. So every one of the people brought his ox with him that night and slaughtered it there. And so we'll, we'll talk about some practical lessons we learned from that. But real quickly, we learn from that that people that may make mistakes like Saul still know what's right and wrong. Saul understood the law about eating with the blood, and the people were sinning by eating with the blood. Verse 36 to 46, Saul finds out Jonathan eats, you know, and they take here, and he asked, they ask God, Shall I go down to the Philistines? Saul seeks the counsel of God. And uh, he, he, he doesn't get an answer. 
So Saul says, come over all you chiefs and the people, and over, I'm in verse 38, and know and see what this sin was today. For as the Lord lives, who saves Israel, though it be Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. Whoever is the sin that is the reason we haven't got an answer shall surely die. Even if what? The sin is found to be by whom? By his own son. So what do they do? They divide the people. They cast Lot, the Saul and Jonathan on one side, the soldiers on the other side. Who does the Lot fall on? Saul and Jonathan. So they take the Lot again, it falls on Jonathan. Saul, by the way, Saul is keeping his word. What's Saul fixing to do? Kill him. And, and Jonathan understood that. He said, I only taste a little honey with the end of my rod in my hand, so now I must die. Jonathan understood that his father must keep his oath. In verse 43, Jonathan is already prepared to die, so the oath is kept. God do so, and more also. Verse 44, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. But the people are going to stop him. Shall Jonathan die, verse 45, who has accomplished the great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not, as the Lord lives. Not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan that he did not die. And the people were returned from pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. Are you going to kill Jonathan? Look, Jonathan's the one that started this whole thing. He went up and he began the battle. Jonathan is the one who's accomplished this great deliverance. He said, he has worked with God this day, so not a hair of his head shall fall. So Saul relents from killing his son. 47 through 52 is just some of Saul's campaigns taking place. Uh, he's fighting against the enemies on, on every side. Let's talk about chapter 15. Saul's sin. This is the sin that ultimately is going to come down to the last meeting between Samuel and Saul. First Samuel chapter 15. The first three verses, the command is given. The command is to destroy the Amalekites. Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the, ver- heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel... How he ambushed him on the day, on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, and camel and donkey. The Amalekites have come out and attacked Israel on their way. This was a battle that takes place at Sinai, the one where Moses has his hands outstretched. You remember, and they had to have people on both sides so his hands would stay outstretched. And, and because of this and them attacking them on the way from Egypt, you need to go, Saul, this is what Samuel tells him, you need to go, Saul, and utterly destroy them, kill everyone, man and woman and child, kill all the livestock, kill everything. Verses 4 to 9 is Saul's disobedience to God's command. Saul gathered the people together and numbered them and tell him, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah... And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay and wait in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites, Go depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, Agag, and listen, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and they were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless they utterly destroyed. So the command was to do what? What's the command from verses 1 to 3? Destroy, utterly destroy. Kill all the people and all the livestock. Saul keeps neither one of those commands. He kills all the people, but who? The king. And he, he kills what of the livestock? Only the worthless. And he keeps the very best back for himself. Or back, back, him and the people keep them back for himself. For themselves. Now we'll talk about what he's going to say in a minute. About what they kept it back for. Let's pick up in verse 10. 10 through 31 is going to be the penalty that is announced for Saul's disobedience. 
Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king as he turned from following me and have not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried out to the Lord all night. So he's going to come to him in verse 12 and he's going to ask him and Saul's going to tell Samuel in verse 13 that I've done what? I performed what? Verse 13. The commandment of the Lord. I've performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel says, What then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? If you've kept all the commandment of the Lord, then what is this? He tells him in verse 15 that they have brought them from the Amalekites. That is, the people have kept them from the Amalekites. The people have kept the very best for themselves. And he's going to tell him, you're no longer going to be king, which he's already told him in chapter 13. And Saul says, but I have obeyed in verse 20, after he talks about why he didn't obey and all this, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and brought back and brought back Agag of the Amalekites, and I have utterly destroyed them. I kept back Agag, but I've utterly destroyed them. He has not utterly destroyed because Agag is still alive. But the people took the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which would have utterly destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. By the way, there's a question here. Is Saul and them really going to sacrifice these things to the Lord, or are they going to keep them for themselves? I think from the text, the indication is they really probably were going to sacrifice them. Because Samuel does not rebuke him for his hypocrisy, but makes the statement that the Lord desired obedience was that obedience to obey is better than sacrifices. But it doesn't really matter. If Saul really was going to sacrifice or Saul was just lying, the principle still applies. They were told to utterly destroy and they did not utterly destroy everything that was there. Saul does acknowledge in verse 24 that he has sinned, that he has transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice, verse 24. But it's too late. He showed a pattern of disobedience and he's been rejected as king. So in verse 32 to 35, Saul's going to execute, or Samuel's going to execute Agag and he'll hack him into pieces. And then they're going to depart. And it's sad. Samuel and Saul will never see each other again. As they depart from one another here in chapter 15. Real quick, let's talk about some practical lessons that we learn in this text. And then, and, and then, uh, or, or, cause our time is almost up. Let's talk about, um, that sin with good intentions is still sin. Twice, twice in our lesson this evening, we've seen the sin of Saul, and both times it seems his sin was with good intentions. Offer a sacrifice to God before you go to battle, and keep the best back to offer as a sacrifice to God. The problem was, in both instances, he put more emphasis on the sacrifice and the obedience, and Samuel's going to point out in chapter 15 that God would have, that obedience or to obey is better than sacrifices. So it doesn't matter how good the intentions are. Somebody may have good intentions behind sin, but sin with good intentions is still wrong. And God can save with few. We saw that with Jonathan and the armor bearer. That shows us the power of God that though the other armies may be great and though the armies fighting for Israel or for whoever it is may be small, the power of God that God can save with but a few. That shows us how great and mighty the power of God is. Ultimately, verse 12 is God is the one who delivers. Jonathan understood that. The Lord has given them in our hands. He didn't say, when they, if they tell us to come up to them, then we are victorious, or we will be victorious over them, but it's the Lord who's going to give them into our hands. Well, one can know, verse 33 and 34, uh, some of the commandments and yet disobey others. As Saul understood the command about the blood. But let's talk right here, verse 24, real quick, the power of pressure. Verse 24, and I don't doubt that this is the case, that Saul listened to the voice of the people over the voice of God. He gave in to the pressure. You can imagine all the people crying, let's keep them back and offer sacrifices to God. And Samuel, Saul, Saul rather listens to that. And he gave in to pressure rather than following the commandments of God. But we've got to make sure we're following the commandments of God and not giving in to the pressures of the world around us. We'll study chapter 16 through 20 next week along with 1 Chronicles chapter 6.